had a starting time at 7. Uh, we had some AV difficulties. Um, so we will begin. Come on in. We're just starting. Perfect timing. First of all, thank you all for coming out this evening. I know that there's, I, we're in competition with a big Chicago event going on right now. Uh, a couple days ago, I started noticing, oh, the Bears playing soon? Uh, and I didn't know, I guess it's Thursday night football. Um, even I, I'm not much of a sports fan, but Bears, Packers, I would watch that if I weren't here. So thank you all for coming out. I'm going to jump right in. My name is Jerry Nash. I am the co-founder and outreach coordinator for Prairie Food Co-op. A little bit about me first, so you know who's talking to you. Uh, our origin story, basically my wife and I moved with our two young kids to Lombard in 2009. Our kids were one and three. We had moved from Urbana, is anybody familiar with Urbana? That's where the U of I is. Uh, and there was a co-op there, Common Ground Food Co-op. Um, that had been there actually since 1974, since I was two years old. Uh, but when we lived there, we volunteered for the co-op and we shopped there. And we loved the co-op. It was like a community experience when you went there. You saw friends. It was nice knowing that you were supporting this local endeavor, this local community-focused store. Uh, so when we moved here, we thought there'd be scores of food co-ops in the Chicago Metroland area, right? Mm. There are actually no co-ops at all. Um, Hyde Park, which had been a co-op that opened like in the 40s, uh, closed down right before we arrived and there are some co-ops now open in Oak Park and Logan Square that weren't open then. They were organizing then just like we are now. But we saw a lot of demand which was the weird thing. We see a lot of uh, people love to go to farmers markets. People are members of local CSAs. Are you all familiar with CSAs? It's basically where you buy a share in a farm for a season and then you pick up like a box of fruits or vegetables once a week or it's dropped off somewhere and you pick it up. There's a lot of CSAs around here uh, from farms that are all around DuPage County, Chicago, a lot around here. Uh, but weirdly, there are no co-ops. So we spent about two or three years complaining about it and then realized that we're not going to get anything done complaining about it. And how do you start a co-op? So we looked into it, we looked into how Common Ground started, how others started, and we started organizing in 2012. And if you can do math, that's been seven years, uh, but we knew that going in it would take a multi-year process, and here I am telling you about how to start a co-op, or about food co-ops. So let's just jump into what is a food co-op? The most simplest definition, if you just boil everything down, is a food co-op is a grocery store that is owned by its community. At the end of the day, that's what a food co-op is. You can also expand it when I talk to people to say a food co-op is a grocery store owned by its community that will focus on selling as much locally produced, transparently labeled food as possible. I stress as possible. Not everything will be local, not everything will be organic, sustainable, but we'll try to get a good mix of all of that. Um, our mission statement is there on the left. I'm not going to read it, but that pretty much sums up what I just said. There are a lot of ways to talk about what a food co-op is. I thought tonight it would be easier just to go over what I think are big, the five hallmarks of what a food co-op is. That's sustainability, food justice, clean and healthy food, a local focus, and community. And really, I'm going to talk about them in no particular order of importance. I think they all kind of equally important. I just chose a certain flow. First of all, I'll jump into clean and healthy food. Basically, if you think about a co-op, and anybody who knows a little bit about a co-op, you know, maybe their sister was part of one or something like that, probably the first thing they think of is the food. Like, oh yeah, co-ops, they, they sell organic food and stuff like that, uh, which is true. Uh, co-ops have been selling organic food for decades, far before conventional grocery stores got on the bandwagon. That's one thing they stole from co-ops. Co-ops have been doing that for a long time. Co-ops have also been places where early on, and I'm talking once again decades ago, where people could find options to perhaps ingredients in food that they were allergic to, like dyes or gluten, or some people who are maybe lactose intolerant. Food co-ops have always been places where people could go to find alternatives to those 
allergens. Um, another thing about co-ops is one in the title it says healthy food and I like to keep that because I do think you can eat very healthfully at a co-op because we sell a lot of food that's more nutrient dense because it's local. I'll talk about that in a minute. But really, at the end of the day, it's not telling people how to eat. It's we're not the food police. It's actually, to me though, transparency. For example, you can get chips, you can get soda, you can get chocolate and desserts. And a lot of things are very bad for you because I know I've been to a lot of co-ops and I love to buy that stuff. But the thing is, with transparency, we at least want you to know how bad you're eating when you eat badly. Um, so signage and letting people know, for example, more what's in their food and especially also where it comes from are hallmarks of food co-ops. For example, up there you see signage that maybe tells you if it's organic or not, or gluten-free, or how far it came. It's hard to see if uh, those have that information on the left. Or the big one, Know Your Eggs, I love that one. That's a common ground. I took a picture of that. That's about all the eggs they carry, because they carry multiple kinds from different farms around Champaign-Urbana, and they give you certain criteria that might be important to you, like do they clip the chicken's wings? Do they clip their beaks? Do they feed them vegetarian feed? Are they free range? Other criteria where you can choose what criteria you want to choose that egg that you want to buy. It's not about telling people how to eat, it's about being transparent and letting them make their own choices for their families. And of course, just access to more simpler food. That's kind of what I meant when I said about soda. Soda's bad for you, no matter what. But I'd like to maybe buy a soda that just had natural sugar in it instead of high fructose corn syrup, or a lot of those other sweeteners that are much more effective or dangerous than just say straight up sugar, or sugar in the wrong. Um, so I, I lean more towards the clean foods instead of saying they're health food stores. Also with the local for focus, of course co-ops support more locally produced food. So that's local farmers, local artisans. And that of course keeps more money in our community. And also local food is simply better. Basically, local food is more nutrient dense because a farmer growing it here at least the farmer we're going to support, it's probably going to be practicing more sustainable practices. They're going to take care of their soil when they grow their food. And they're going to take care of the soil in a way that the produce that we're buying is literally going to be more nutritionally dense than, say, produce that another store could be buying 2,000 miles away, coming from Mexico or California, uh, where one, it was probably grown in a way that wasn't about the nutrients. It was probably about seeing how big it could get in a fast amount of time and how fast they could get it to us. So just local food is more nutritionally dense too. And I'll talk about the other things, the other mentions there. Um, also with local focus, you tend to see a more stronger food economy around food co-ops. For example, job creation. Of course, we will, Prairie Food Co-op, when we open, will be when we start out, expecting to hire 30 to 40 people and at maturity be about 70 to 80 people. Now, of course, if you think about it, conventional grocery stores hire people too. So it's not like we're, you know, some great thing over that. But if you think about co-ops tend to hire more people at full time, therefore they tend to get more benefits and they do often, most always, most of the time get a living wage. Around here, I believe that's $12 to $13 an hour. Uh, also about the local economy, of course, when you buy more locally, more dollars stay here in our community. At a conventional grocery store, does anybody have any idea how much food is usually local at a conventional grocery store? Any guesses? Less than 15%. <laughs> Good guesses? It's 6%. Whereas food co-ops can reach about 50%. And I actually think in the Chicago area we can reach more because they got more innovative technology that grows food uh, indoors. And of course, Chicago, you can get a lot of things locally. So around here, I think we can meet a much higher percentage than 50%. But where you see food co-ops, you see a big boost in their economy. Basically, co-ops on average, and this is an old statistic, you see a million more dollars in their Annually, than when you see a place with no co op. 
Also innovation. When you see food co-ops, you see a lot of small artisanal businesses that are surrounding that co-op that otherwise couldn't succeed without the co-op there. So you see a lot of people maybe making soap or pickles or beef jerky or kombucha or other small little uh, businesses that otherwise maybe couldn't succeed if they weren't around the co-op. So you see a lot of that, a lot of unique businesses around the food co-op. And there are educational programs for our community, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, but also farms. Farms have had a great relationship with food co-ops. Farms love co-ops and co-ops love farms. And that's because, kind of like the same with innovation, when you see food co-ops, they tend to want to support their own local or smaller farms around them. So you see farmers be able to succeed in a place where there's a food co-op when they maybe otherwise wouldn't. And just like the small businesses, you see more innovative farms. Maybe you see somebody who's growing something other than corn or soybean, which is pretty much what's grown in Illinois, which is kind of sad because we have some of the most nutrient uh, st strong soil in the world. Um, so you see people growing different things like maybe hops or flowers. There's a person local, I think she's in Naperville actually, she's got a farm where she actually buys flowers, or grows flowers. And I didn't know, but most flowers actually that we buy at the store come from like Vietnam, and they're practically dipped in chemicals and to smell, and you're smelling all those chemicals. So when you see a co-op, we can support more local endeavors. Also food values, another way to put this is food justice. It's to me wanting to buy more ethically food and more ethically produced food and food co-ops do a good job of that. Um, for example, first of all, co-ops exist in some, some reason to pay farmers and pr food producers a fair wage. For example, when you see the low, low prices at a lot of conventional grocery stores around here, places like Walmart, and I don't want to make anybody feel guilty if you shop at Walmart, I sometimes have to go there for some reasons, but basically when you see those low prices, that means somebody's losing out in that equation, or multiple people are losing out. It's usually not the store. The store's doing fine, but maybe they're kind of, the farmer's losing out, because they're telling the farmer or the small food producer, this is what we're going to pay. If you don't like it, we're just not going to give you any livelihood at all or oftentimes it's the employees who are not getting the good end of that stick. So in order to enrich communities, co-ops like to pay their food producers, their farmers, their employees, a fair wage and a fair price for their goods because that builds a stronger community. And also something you see in a lot of co-ops is trying to get access to clean, healthy food to lower income populations in their community. And you can see that a lot of different ways. For example, that's Common Ground. They have a program where basically they've identified over 200 products in their store that they think most people need, like staples. Uh, so like flour or rice or milk. And for people who apply for this program, and all they gotta do is apply. They don't like do some background research. They just trust that people are going to tell the truth. Everybody gets 10% off that. And also the people who are in that program get 10% off maybe educational, or they get free, <coughs> free admittance to a lot of educational workshop opportunities. Also, there's something called the Roundup program. Um, every co-op, well not every, but a lot of co-ops have different versions of this with their own twist on it, which I think is cool. Basically at Common Ground, they have it, it's called Roundup, where say you go to the register and the total of your groceries like $16.40. And they say, would you like to round that up? You say, yeah, so they round it up to $17. That 60 cents goes in a little fund that's accruing for the whole month. And at the end of that month, it goes to a local charity that all the members and owners decided that they would like that month's Roundup program to go to. And what I've seen, I've seen the average is about $1,500 for them. So 12 times a month, 12 times a year, they're giving $15 to $2,000 to a local charity, which I think is pretty cool. Also, with food value, you see access to ethically produced products uh, like cruelty-free or fair trade or sweatshop-free. 
For example, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of I Have a Bean, which when we open, I hope we carry them. I imagine we will. They're based out of Wheaton. Um, they actually have to order their coffee beans. There's not a lot of coffee bean growers around here. But they roast them on site. And the cool thing about them, I think 90% of their employees are ex-convicts. So they're helping people who would otherwise find it hard to get a job, give them employment, give them dignity, give them a livelihood. So that's kind of what I mean with that. Also, there's a picture of a woman holding a t-shirt. We sell t-shirts, and a long time ago, we decided that we just can't talk the talk, we gotta walk the walk. So the t-shirts we sell, they're a mixture of cotton, organ organic cotton, and recycled waterworks. Um, and they're also made here, the t-shirts themselves are manufactured here in the States, and we actually have a local screen printer, Monica, she lives in Lombard, uh, she owns a shop in Lombard, she prints them. So we keep everything local and ethical as much as possible. And real quick, I didn't know this till about last week. Did you know that the fashion industry is the third biggest emitter of carbon after meat production and oil production? So I'm glad we made that decision. <laughs> and also there's, of course, a community aspect. As I mentioned earlier, just shopping at a co-op, you just feel like you're part of your community, you feel like you're bettering your community. Um, and for example, in that picture up there above, that's Robin and James Davidson, and on the bottom, that's Mark and Lise, and they, they respectively own farms around here. And I've met them, and I've shaken their hands, and I've seen their operations. I've seen how their animals are raised, how they're treated. And you know, I know some people are vegetarians or vegans, which I respect, and maybe they made the decision they don't want to meat because it's for their own ethical reasons but the way I look at it is I for example eat meat but I'm always trying to lower my intake all the time but it's just not going to be overnight but I certainly would like to know that I'm supporting a farm that's treating their animals right um, also part of the community aspect is co-ops are democratically overseen when you're an owner slash member of a co-op you can run for the board or you can vote for the and co-ops tend to reflect what their community wants in general anyway. Not every single decision is made by a vote. That would actually be catastrophic and not work too well, but wouldn't be very practical. But co-ops know, the GMs of co-ops know, the staff knows, you should listen to your community, especially your community of owners. Is the board paid? Excuse me? Is the board paid? No. Um, yeah, to answer that, basically co-ops are all volunteer until the moment they pay. They may have a person or two they pay beforehand. For example, a lot of times they pay the outreach coordinator, um, just because they get to a level where a volunteer needs to volunteer more hours and they can usually volunteer. But usually, once they're open, it's 100% paid staff. So, and yeah, the board's never paid. Um, so another part of co-ops that I love is the engagement with our community. Every co-op I've ever seen has some aspect of that. Some are lucky enough to have, like, say, a teaching kitchen if they've been around or they've expanded. Um, but if you don't, you know, you use community spaces like this. This is, is an outreach opportunity for us. We worked with uh, Elmhurst Public Library, and this is actual programming, which we're actually proud to be partnered with. But we've also offered scores of workshops over the years, like a kombucha workshop or a cooking raw mm -hmm. workshop, canning. Mm -hmm. So many cool workshops we've had over the years. We have one next week, actually, with Crystal here. Oh, that's it. me. Um, yeah. Knife skills. <laughs> that's the recording. I didn't yes. know that. <laughs> See, we, did, we just cover so many aspects of volunteering. Um, but we're excited about that. Uh, next to that, I just included that picture. We did a beekeeping workshop with one of our board members. She's a beekeeper. And I just love that little girl with her little outfit. Like, that was so her. cute. That was so cute. Like, where it's do you like buy them? It's like a little bumblebee. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, where do you get those? <laughs> yeah. Um, but that was a really Amazon. cool workshop. And, you know, I'm proud of all the workshops we're doing, but it seems like lately we're hitting a groove where our workshops are really engaging and people love them. And on the right there is just a list of other uh, workshops that I think that's common ground that they have. Um, I think that's a fun aspect of co-ops. And sustainability. This is something when we started years ago, 
I never really thought of, uh, except for bonus, because I'm environmental, you know, I'm conscious of all that. But when we started seven years ago, I just looked at that as like bonus, like that's awesome. But now I'm looking at it like, wow, that's one of the biggest reasons I want to start a co-op. Because co-ops are conscious. They're, they try to be as sustainable as possible. Uh, by, of course, by buying as much local as possible, locally prepared food, local grown food, you're automatically lowering the carbon footprint because that food doesn't drive 2,000 miles in the first place. But something that people don't think about either is like the refrigerants that a lot of that food that's coming 2,000 miles have to be in. And another fun fact, refrigerants are a bigger actual aspect to climate change than actual CO2 is. So that's one way that supporting your local co-op uh, keeps the carbon footprint down. But also co-ops recycle a lot more than conventional grocery stores. And there's less food waste. Uh, I've worked at conventional grocery stores, natural grocery stores, and actually food co-ops. And conventional grocery stores, the only place I've seen them throw away 50 gallons of milk into a dumpster that wasn't even expired, simply because they were getting a shipment of milk the next day. And they're not going to spend the manpower to try to talk to a charity to, take, to pick it up. You know, it's just not cost effective. And the way I always say it, uh, conventional grocery stores, business in general, they're not, they're not immoral, uh, they're just amoral. They just have one goal, and that's to make money. Uh, but also food co-ops, they work with charities more, food banks actually. And a lot of times what I've seen, say you have maybe some produce that's gone past to where a food bank can use it or something like that, make compost out of it and sell it. Or I used to be a cook in the army and I was stationed in Germany. They had a bunch of slop buckets that people put all the food in. Farmers would pick it up once, twice a week, um, and heat it up, and serve it to their livestock. So with those options, you don't have to waste nearly as much as conventional grocery stores. And actual food waste does contribute to a heavy carbon footprint. It's one of the leading causes, too. Is there a question? question on the last, on the last screen? Uh, on the bottom right, that, that, who, who pledged that? Oh, right. Um, That's very important. I mean, I, I started thinking I would love to just buy things not in plastic, but that's yeah. really hard right now, right? I mean, I, mm -hmm. I even just, like, some things are not plastic, but the cap is or something. I'm yeah. Sure. No, that's something you start to think about. And like yeah. I said, I've started thinking about more. All the peripheral things around us now. And yeah, Outpost, they're a uh, co-op in the Wisconsin area, in Milwaukee. I think they have five or six stores. They're an actual co-op chain, which we can dream <laughs> But uh, they, they pledge that they'd be free of single-use plastics in 2022. Wow. They've already started with produce bags, but they just uh, started using compostable, biodegradable deli packaging, too. And so that's going to make a big difference in the Milwaukee area. And what about containers? Yeah. Well, right. Well, like the deli Will containers. Will they be glass containers? No, like say spaghetti sauce. Or... Right. Well, we can talk a little bit more about, I think I'm going to be talking about, yeah, the bulk okay. section in a second. Okay, sorry. But, um, no, it's fine. Yeah. And also, while we're mentioning Organic Valley, they just opened a facility within the last year that's 100% Completely reliant on renewable energy. So, and also I don't know, Organic Valley, there's a brand you see a lot. And sometimes you see brands, and you're like, oh, okay, like it's almost greenwashing, like you may be technically organic. But they actually, they're, they themselves are co-op of dairy farmers in the Midwest. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. And then there are also co-ops are big leaders and have been big leaders, especially in the bulk section. Basically, this, which you are starting to see in more conventional grocery stores, those have been a hallmark of co-ops for decades. Basically, if there's anything that you can put uh, into a jar, into a bag, perhaps, a reusable one, uh, and you know, weigh it later, like grains or spices, teas, coffee, beans, <clears throat> if you can think of it that can fit to a bag, a lot of co-ops have that in their bulk section. Plus, this is a great way to find savings at co-ops because as we um, 
sure you all are aware, a lot of the cost of food is the packaging itself. So that's a great thing about food co-ops. And as mentioned on the right, even Sugar Beet and Oak Park, they just went to biodegradable produce bags. Um, and I think that's cool on the left. That company, I don't think they're any sort of co-op or anything like that, but they're a Florida company um, who made their six-pack rings biodegradable and actual edible to sea turtles. Uh, instead of ensnaring them in one of their plastic loops, that will help feed them. And so you're seeing a lot more of this. And plus, as we've already demonstrated, conventional grocery stores, conventional food makers steal a lot of ideas from food co-ops. Uh, and if they're going to steal some of these ideas that makes our environment better, I'm fine with that. So and before I move on, did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. Um, now, there are some places, say in Europe, that have 100% package-free stores, which that's great to dream about. I don't think we can get there yet around here, but uh, we can always move forward with what we've got, which is a lot. So another way, I talked about the hallmarks, another way of addressing what food co-ops are is to kind of address the myths that are out there. A lot of people have in their heads what food co-ops are. Um, and believe me, I know this by talking to a lot of people. I can talk to a lot of people about what food co-ops are, explain that they're grocery stores like this, and at the end of the day, they'll still think they're a CSA or some sort of charity, um, or a food bank, or a health food store. No, food co-ops are full-service mm -hmm. grocery stores. Mm -hmm. uh, back in the old days, they used to be maybe a little bit more bohemian. Uh, maybe you need a secret map to find them, and there's definitely a bohemian <laughs> vibe in them. Maybe some of them didn't carry, even meat or cheese, they had more of a radical kind of point of view. And nowadays co-ops are opening big, beautiful stores that are open to everybody in their community. And they are for profit. Uh, but the difference between grocery stores and conventional is that the profits, 90% of the time, put back into the co-op so we can grow and remain a strong force in our community. Uh, another myth is that only hippies, liberals, vegetarians, or rich people shop. Uh, no, that's one thing I've learned being in the natural food business for years, uh, being into co-ops. Food is definitely a bipartisan issue. Uh, I happen to be somewhat of a lefty, but I know conservative friends who shop at food co-ops. <coughs> I remember at that food co-op, I continually see this huge pickup that had a bumper sticker, and this may date me, but it said, he won, get over it. Uh, this was the George Bush era. Uh, <laughs> So no, co-ops are bipartisan and they welcome every type of person. Uh, a lot of people think that when you join a co-op, you have to volunteer, you gotta be on the board, which is understandable if you think that, because that was a lot of the old model. A lot of co-ops back in the day used to require people volunteer. In fact, I volunteered for Common Ground when they were still in the basement of a church. Um, and there are some that are really hardcore, like Park Slope of Brooklyn, they're 100% volunteer, 100% owner, but 100% of the co-ops I've seen organizing today, uh, you don't have to volunteer. In fact, it's good to have more of a paid staff because you tend to see co-ops with volunteers, kind of this clicky, kind of hippie-ish vibe, people kind of judging you for buying certain things they don't approve of, um, and that's not really good to grow a successful co-op that's got to compete with conventional grocery stores. A lot of people also think they're like Costco or Sam's, where you gotta pay an annual fee. No, it's just a one-time fee. It's kind of a phantom slide right there. Um, and becoming an owner is expensive. I think a lot of people hear the word owner, because we like to use the word owner, because you literally own it. We could also use member, but to me, I like owner, it's stronger. But I do think some people think, oh, owner, you know, that's $5,000, I'm sure. It's just a one-time cost of $200. Uh, Co-ops vary. For us, it's $200. Um, so we try to do that. And what that does, well, I'll explain that later what that does. Okay, that's kind of weird. But that does, okay. Only owners can shop the food co-op. No, that's a myth, too. That may have been true 30, 40 years ago. Now, 100% of co-ops I know of that are organizing, uh, everybody in the community can shop at a food co-op. The only difference is, is that 
ownership, being an owner, does have its benefits. Probably the most recognizable one is access to special store sales, discounts, or owner specials, for example. Um, Sugar Beet, I know, you can pick one shopping trip per month where you would get 5% off, maybe 10%. Uh, but every day they'll have sales on a lot of items that are on sale that day just for owners. Or they'll have days called owner appreciation days where every single owner that comes in that day gets an across the board uh, discount. Or you get 20% off case buys. That's a pretty common thing you see at co-ops. And also you see free or discounted admission for owners at food co-ops, which I think that's a lot of fun. I think that adds a lot of value. Um, even the knife skills <laughs> we're having next week, there's a owner level and a non-owner level. Also, something I think is pretty cool and unique is it, not every co-op participates in about this, but I could be perhaps somewhere in Minnesota or Michigan and stop at a co-op and tell them, they'll ask if I'm an owner to see if I can get benefits for them from them. I'll say I'm not an owner here, but I'm a Prairie Food Co-op in Lombard, Illinois. And they might, it's a good chance, give us the benefits that they give their owners. It's called reciprocal benefits, which I think is pretty cool. And also, honestly, this is kind of touchy-feely, but to me, the biggest reason to become an owner of a co-op is that it is such a beneficial, positive thing you can do for your community. I truly believe that if there are co-op other community, a lot of our issues we have in our environments across the nation um, economically would be solved. And so, pretty much explain a lot about aspects of co ops, what they are, what they're not. You may be asking yourself, okay, but how do they work? How do they actually get started? Um, and so, I'll just quickly go over that. Basically, you start off, you see a demand. Like in my story to you, how when me and my wife moved here, we actually saw a demand. We saw the packed farmers markets. We saw the CSAs. We saw a lot of demand, a lot of food buying clubs. So the demand was there. Then the second part of that is organize. You basically got to get the word out. Hey, any, are there other people in this community who are interested? You maybe start with a couple meetings. You get the word out. Um, and this is when you gotta try to actually start to apply some talent or persuasion in your quest. And if you're lucky, you'll get a lot of people mm -hmm. jump aboard like we were. And from day one, we've had scores, hundreds of people in our community who have stepped up over the years. And honestly, even compared to other co-ops, we are so lucky in this area to get such a high standard of help. Um, after that, once you see the communities, you got your volunteers, communities interested, maybe you've been doing it for a year, you think you get a good feeling out there, uh, you start to sell ownership shares, which is basically ownership shares are the backbone of every co-op. It's the building block. You cannot open a food co-op without hundreds or thousands of owners supporting this endeavor. Hundreds of thousands? Well, hundreds, yeah, that didn't sound like it did. Uh, <laughs> back in the old days, you could open. <laughs> Well, back in the old day, you could start, maybe you could open a co-op, maybe in the hundreds, okay. but now you need upwards of thousands, not thousands. hundreds of thousands. <laughs> thousands of right. For thousands. example, we've got about 1,100, well, no, 10,050 owners today. 10, We're probably, no, 1,050. 1,000. Me and numbers. So. <laughs> 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 uh, numbers, yeah, but you're saying 1,050, but you need... Well, it comes to a point where we feel we're high enough to where we can start our capital campaign, which I'm mm. just about to mm. talk about. But, you know, there have been co-ops that have been open for years that are the tens of thousands of owners. But for us to open, to start our capital campaign, we want to be in the thousands, which is where we are. Um, so yeah, so for over the last six years, we've been selling ownership spares. We're over a thousand owners. We seek to recruit more owners. In fact, even after you're open, you're always recruiting owners because you want as many people in your community to be invested in the co-op as possible. So once you start getting hundreds of owners, maybe around the 300 mark, the 500 mark, uh, you want to do a market study to access your feasibility, to look at your market to see if your community would support it. Uh, for example, at 250 owners, we had a market study that looked at our 
demographics that looked at our market area. For example, our market area will be mostly Lombard, Villa Park, Glen Ellen, and Elmhurst, which will be most of it. Um, but you also look at certain locations in your community. Are they on thoroughfares? Are they easy to access? Can people see your signage? There are a lot of different criteria you want to think about when you're thinking about a store. And that was our first, we've had five market studies since then. You want to always be updating that. So when you do open, you want to be as current. Those numbers need to be as accurate as possible because they're worth their weight in gold when you go to a bank and want to borrow money to open. Which takes me to raise capital, uh, otherwise known as a capital campaign. Uh, just the money you get from ownership shares, if you do the math, is not going to open your store. Say we had 1,200 owners right now. If you do the math, that would be $240,000, which is a nice chunk, but it takes millions of dollars. For us, it's gonna take four million. So that doesn't come close. The ownership shares just propel you forward as you're organizing. It pays for marketing, it pays for branding, it pays for the market studies. Um, but now we're at the point where we're right on the verge where we gotta raise $4 million, which sounds like a lot because it is a lot. But we've got a plan. Co-ops have done this before us, and we've got a plan to do it ourselves. What we'll, most co-ops do is try and raise half of that through their owners, asking their owners for loans. Not every owner has to say yes or will say yes. But you want to get, we're going to shoot to get $2 million through loans and preferred shares from our owners. And those offer attractive interest rates, and we try to make those as, we try to incentivize those as much as possible. Um, and then what you see a lot of other co-ops do is then you got your two million, maybe you raise that other two million dollars through banks, through gap loans, through bridge loans. We're actually gonna try to see if we can get as much of it from our community, because when you do it from your owners and from your community, you actually have a little more flexibility in your pro forma after you open, which helps you, helps guarantee more success later. Um, and then you build your store. Basically, we're securing our site in the process, haven't done it yet, it's not 100% uh, certain, but we're securing a site in Lombard. At the, across the street from the Metro Center, if you're familiar with Lombard, there's this big empty lot where the DuPage uh, mm -hmm. Theater used to be. Uh, there's a development coming there where our grocery store is gonna be part of that development. If it goes through, I can't promise that yet. Um, but. That, of course, is an exciting time because you see a lot of people who have been on the fence for years since you started that you've been trying to recruit. When they, once they start seeing your store get built, the excitement kind of gets into the community. You see a lot more owners jump aboard. Um, and then eventually you build your store and you open your store. And I'll, oh, go ahead. What, what street is that? It'll be at the intersection of Main and Park. <coughs> okay. so, yeah, it's going to be at the south part of the underpass that goes from downtown to Main Street um, on the, what is that, the southeast corner. Uh, if you're familiar with Brust Funeral Home, it'll be kind of abut against that. Wish I had a picture. Um, so after you build your store, a lot of co-ops don't plan for this, but be successful. It's actually, a lot of co-ops are so focus on opening that you forget that part. I would not say that there have been so many co-ops that fail, but they do fail. They actually fail at a much, much lower rate than other retail endeavors, but they still fail. Um, and we're already thinking about how we bridge that gap from opening, uh, from organizing to where we've got 100% volunteers, where we have a different type of energy. On some level, we're more uh, committed and more we have more insight into this process. But when you open, you literally hand the keys over to a GM and a paid staff. And while I'm sure they want it to succeed too, it's a different vibe. And a lot of co-ops have, haven't really thought about that aspect. Um, and some of them have struggled. We're actually already thinking about how do we keep that energy that we had when we were organizing into the opening of the store without stepping on the toes of the GM and the paid staff, because you can't do that either. So that's something to think about, and that's something we are thinking about. So just the last couple slides here. Basically, 
these are co-ops that have actually opened with similar demographics to what Prairie Food Co-op have, will have. Uh, not exact because it's really hard to find co-ops that have opened in the suburbs that are a rare thing. They usually open in college towns or in urban areas. Um, but these are similar to our demographics. That's in Harrisburg, Virginia, friendly city, uh, 50,000 population. They opened recently, 2011, 10,000 square foot store. That's probably what we'll be about, maybe eight, nine, 10,000 square feet. Uh, in their first year, they exceeded their profit expectations, which is awesome, uh, especially awesome if you're organizing. I'm sure that relieves them a lot. And they're already planning an extension. Um, and then there's Portland Co-op in Portland, Maine. Uh, they've got a population of 66,000, uh, which is closer to Lombard, but I'll say too, I just kind of touched on it, we're gonna serve our whole community as suburbs. These, these are different as far as these are more solitary towns. Uh, but they opened even more recently in 2014, another 10,000 square foot store, and they're doing four million annual sales, which is awesome. So on that note, I'll just say that, you know, I'm here to talk about food co-ops. I, I can't really uh, talk about joining Prairie Food Co-op, or although in more, most circumstances I would be, but I'm partnering with the EPL, so I'm just talking about co-ops. But co-ops in your community make your community stronger. And consider the benefits of co-ops, and I won't say anything else about co-ops because I want to be sure not to twist your arm about Prairie Food Co-op. Uh, but if you are interested, we do have brochures over there. And if you're even interested, at some presentations I've done, I see people taking notes. I can even send you a copy of this presentation if you want to put your email in there. But um, otherwise, we can open a discussion. We can have some Q&A. Just uh, wondering when um, development would begin at that corner and what would actually stop the Prairie Food Co-op from actually joining the development? It's <clears throat> a good question. Uh, they are actually on, on the course to finalize their lease in December. Things aren't always certain when it comes to villages and towns, as we may all know if you're involved. Uh, but right now, that's on the docket for December. What might fall through is that they just might not be amenable to our terms they've already pre-agreed to get that spot, that they, they agreed to certain aspects, like for example, giving us $10 per square foot, which is a good rate for that property. But we will have other wants that every grocery store would want, conventional or not, and we, we are going to advocate for ourselves. So a deal could fall through, they don't want that, or if they don't want to give us the parking we need, or if they don't want to give, access to food truck delivery. There are many aspects you gotta think about when you're opening a co-op. And if we don't advocate for ourselves, we will we could fail. So we are going to advocate for our wants um, and hopefully we can we can negotiate with them for a lease that's fair to them and fair to us. But that is how that can fall through. Have you thought about just um, renting a building? <coughs> Yeah, in fact, that's usually... I mean, aren't a lot of businesses going out of, you know, going out of business and there are storefronts that are available? Yeah, well, at the end of the day, we will be renting the space. We're, we couldn't afford to build a whole development and a whole grocery store uh -huh. unless we got some great, like the land we bought, you know. Some clubs have actually had, like, where they buy the land for a dollar because they got some great deal with their village or their city. Yeah. Um, Lombard Village had been somewhat supportive, but they're, I don't think they're like an Oak Park that kind of embraced their community. Um, but yeah, most co-ops actually do buy an old space and they renovate. Uh, sometimes they buy, sometimes they just work with a landlord who helps them renovate. But in this case, they're gonna build our store for us and we're gonna rent it from them. So, so you're never gonna own the property? No, not with this plan. Honestly, just got to really... It's, it's so out there, <laughs> you know. So yeah. most grocery stores rent, though. I mean, even a big chain rent. Mm -hmm. They don't own them. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so. 
Yeah, I mean, on some level, it's easier to rent, but on other levels, it's nice if you can own the store, because then it's an asset when you go for a loan, because uh, mm -hmm. banks want to see assets that they can seize if you don't. Uh, so there's a lot of pluses and minuses to owning versus not owning a building. Other questions? Yes. I'm curious how you settled on Lombard as the final location. Well, long story short, my wife and I are from Lombard. Um, that's where we started it. That's where the majority of our volunteers, actually the majority of our owners are from. Um, that being said, I think probably Glen Ellen or Elmhurst would actually support a food co-op. It would be much easier. But I also look at it as Lombard's kind of the between between a lot of communities. And, you know, sometimes I just think Lombard needs something. You know, Elmhurst, Glen Ellen, they have lovely downtowns. Lombard's getting there. But I, you know, personally I live in Lombard and I'd like to see it there. And, um, maybe we'll have chains in Elmhurst. <laughs> there is like no grocery store in the heart of Lombard anymore. There has not been for a long time. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Mr. Z's, if you're familiar with that, closed, what's that been, five years now? I, that's like two blocks away from me. And I'd love, I'm cooking dinner and I need something like Capers. It's nice to run to something close. And since they closed, I don't have that. Now I will say though, you could see the writing on the wall if you'd been there before they closed. They weren't keeping up with the modern changes that you see at grocery stores. You know, they didn't even have scales till like two years before they closed. So it's not that that part of town can't sustain a grocery store, but you need a smart grocery store that stays up with all the trends of today. Yeah, my daughter lives in Lombard and she refers to it as a food desert. <laughs> yes, and you know, it's close, it's not, uh, it's not technically a food desert, but it's very close. You have to drive to get yeah. to anywhere. Well, there's some people I know who live downtown and told me they shop at Walgreens. Right. You know, often, you know, the, like the cafe over there. He doesn't have a lot of time. He gets off at 7. He goes to Walgreens, which is, oh. You know, there's a dollar store on Main, you know. Yeah, ever since Mr. Z's left, North Lombard's vacant of any source of actual real nutrient-dense food. And on that note, because this is another question people have, a lot of people ask, why don't you take Mr. Z space? Mm -hmm. um, because we need to open a 10,000 square foot store, that's 26,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. You know, that'd be more to opening mm -hmm. a huge conventional grocery store or a roller rink or something like that. <laughs> we can't take on that much property, that <laughs> much, yeah, maybe we should. <laughs> uh, that much, we'd have to renovate, we'd almost have to tear it down because I've heard that building is riddled with pretty much dated infrastructure. So that's why we can't really do that. Very interesting. Any other questions? Because I have a really good friend in a wheelchair, I'm wondering if you made your um, displays accessible for people like that. They might, or if you actually tried them out with someone who's handicapped to see if it was um, difficult for them and discouraging for them to shop there. Oh, that's a good point. I do know our entrance will be ADA compliant. It's pretty much a flat level. I can't speak to the actual displays. Yeah. So I was curious because we spend a lot of time together and it's just amazing to me things that say handicap accessible and really they're, they're not. She, she doesn't mind telling me that, you know, they're difficult. And oh, yeah. And um, it's awkward, you know, for an adult that wants to do things themselves, of course, you know, does everything else, you know, has a job and everything. Well, it so would be nice. If you're making a new store, you might want to. I don't know if you can. Yeah, well, yeah. definitely that'll be. And I think anymore, when you build new, you, they do have to be ADA, ADA compliant, well, yeah. especially on a project like that. Yeah. For now, for now, but the way things are going, things are rolling back. So. Yeah, and the, and the things. Yeah. My point is the things that people say are ADA. You know, like when they have a sign on the door, you know, that it's that it is. Workable, but it's not. They probably never had someone in a wheelchair or whatever um, actually try to use it. Or reach over to the giant, you know, shelf of tomatoes, try to get the one. It's, it's 
so much harder you know, than you think, and they end up asking people, and then pretty soon they won't ask. And they just don't well, just so I'm just making a point there for my friend's sake, good to keep that here. But I've been with her in those situations, and it's just kind of, you know. Because that's part of the community that yeah. speaking to one another and visiting, and yeah. oh, you know, give me, give me a nice tomato, or you yeah. know, opening up that way. Right, but if there's nobody there, then no Right. Yeah, you know, like I said, I can't speak much to that. I do know our construction itself will be ADA compliant. That's good. And um, we have two tools in our first, and the produce is pretty dreadful. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's always old and it's scary. So are you going to have good produce? Oh, yeah. We are going to source as much produce as possible. Like I said, you know, there's no local grower of bananas or citrus. but as much local produce as we possibly can, which I actually do think is a lot, even in the Midwest in cold months because of all the innovation in Chicago. And even farmers practice a lot of innovation, like coop houses, where they can grow further into the season and start earlier. Uh, yeah, definitely, and it'll be much more nutrient-dense food because local small farmers, they care about their soil. It's not just monoculture for them. They have to practice sustainable farming practices or they'll go out of business. So yes, I can definitely say we will. Because you can definitely taste the difference, when you look at, say Canada, mm -hmm. it tastes so much more fresh and flavorful. It's the good thing. In my opinion. It is. It's the president. Looking forward to that. Yeah. Do you have a working facility now? No. We are just still organizing. Um, that's a normal thing for food co-ops. It takes years. You know, it takes, we used to say five, seven years. We're on year seven, so we're kind of, but I just think that's a common trend we're going to see as construction costs, as food costs, as everything costs rise. For example, like I kind of mentioned earlier, people used to maybe do a market study at 600 owners and start their capital campaign at 800 owners. We can't do that because we need to raise our base of owners to make our statistics, statistics better when we ask for loans, preferred shares. And I imagine, I don't know of any co-op that hasn't opened yet that will be different. They're gonna have to open more too. So no, we're not open yet. Um, and yeah, we. some people suggested maybe you sell food in the interim, maybe at markets and stuff like that. But pretty much what we've decided and what the advice we got from consultants is that you don't want to do that because then you'll just turn into a buying club. We need to focus our attention on opening and getting the word out. Have yeah. you checked with Oak Park to see what his work for them? Yes, uh, I actually worked at the Sugar Bee uh, for a while. And yeah, they actually stumbled when they went out the gate. If that's what you're talking about, just their general success. Yeah, they stumbled out the gate and they needed some heavy consultation from food co-op consultants to write it. But you know, they, in my opinion, I don't think they, they were in a hurry to open. And I was there when they opened. I was there two weeks before they opened. I was getting the store ready. And to me, opening, you have one chance to make a first impression. So you gotta get your pricing right, definitely. Um, and that doesn't mean everything can be bargain based when it can, but you gotta price it in a way. There are things that people talk about when they see prices, milk, bread, stuff like that. In my opinion, they should have waited another week to open, get everything ready, nice, keep some of those prices down, even if it was a loss. That's my opinion. Um, and even just things like merchandising. They didn't have end caps. They didn't have stuff at the register, which you don't realize is so much profit for. So it was just little things like that. Shelving, facing, facing products properly. You know, it's really interesting if you get, there's even a name for it, it's the science of groceries. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of fascinating if you get to that. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, are there surveys that you would go through and look? Because we know about product placement. You know? Yeah. So you would, you, would you be going through that kind of science? Like well, probably with us, it's just, we're just going to put a lot of our energies into hiring a good GM. If you open a co-op, your GM is one of, it's not the most, but it's one of the biggest 
decisions you'll make. And I'm talking to this a nationwide search. You gotta take that seriously. A lot of people ask me like, Jerry, are you gonna be the GM? I'm like, <laughs> like no, that would be disastrous. <laughs> you know, I want a co-op that will succeed. We need to hire a GM that's got multiple GM, multiple years of GM, of grocery store at least, but preferably organic grocery, or food co-ops. So that's gonna be a serious search. A lot of stuff will just kind of go to the GM. Um, I remember a story when Dominic was bought out by that California company. I can't remember them right now. We ought to talk to the managers because the managers are pretty accessible here in Elmhurst. Yeah. They've always been that way. And um, he was telling me, I've been here 25 years and the corporate is sending 22 year olds in here to tell me how to run my store. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. odd. It's like, and that's when Dominic just went. Oh, right. Yeah. I just thought of that. That's maybe why they closed. Because <laughs> you, you need people with experience doing it. It's not an easy job. A lot of people complain about sales, upper management, that they're doing just sales. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And actually, I kind of look at, honestly, I think you may all think I got, you know, a bone to pick with conventional grocery stores. I actually don't. I shop at it myself. I like some of the experiences out of it. I look at Mariano's kind of as like Dominic's. It, they were kind of fun and glitzy at first, the bells and whistles, but I think that's kind of, and you know, their whole bread, say bakery area, it looks like it's out of a European village somewhere. Um, but you look at the ingredients and those all look pretty modern. You know, it's got the same 30 ingredients, this crafted looking bread as the Wonder Bread does. And to me, there's just, not much uh, original or uniqueness to these big, and they, like I said, they have the bells and whistles, they're fun at first, but then they slowly start taking all those things away until where, I went there a couple weeks ago and this was like six o'clock on a weekday and there were three cashiers. The whole place with hundreds of people, you know? Mm -hmm. They do that over and over. Kroger will ruin it, just give them a little more time. Yeah, it's kind of the... This is the Ohio girl who grew up with Kroger, absolutely. Yeah. And they just give them a little time. It's funny because I'm from Decatur down south, central Illinois, and Kroger's down there too. They're just not in this market. Although, yeah, they're already They are now. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 way, it's way Kroger. Kroger yeah. used to be here. Sure. Well, I'm so old, yeah. but I remember. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's probably not this good. There's too much competition. I looked at the Dominic's corporate when I was still like Mr. D. Well, we can all keep discussing amongst ourselves. But <laughs> 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 I'll just put the football game on. <laughs> just I'm not that. Basically, a vegetarian, but I do have my body tells me it is. So, are you going to have meats or local meats? Yeah, we'll have meat. I hope it's mostly local. But once again, not everything can be local or stink, you know. Yeah. But yeah, we'll carry meat. We just probably won't have a big yeah. dedicated like market to butchering. Some of it will be refrigerated or even frozen. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we'll try to source from local but farmers like Walnut Acres and Rustic Roads. But the question the farmers that like if you drive west of here, it's pretty shocking to see like all of a sudden all these giant um, farms that just have like these yeah. Yeah. Well, I mentioned Rustic Road. They're literally off Roosevelt, okay. right next to Batavia. Okay. And you yeah. go in a little right. bit. They've got a good operation there. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons we have to go so far is healthier. Right. One of the reasons I don't eat I don't want to eat a hamburger with a thousand different cows in it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good point, yeah. You know, I read a book about McDonald's. And yeah, so if I knew the farmer and I knew, like you said, how it was raised, where it was raised, I was more likely 